Ah, there we go. I had some unmute challenges there. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the 2021 Prevent Cancer Advocacy Workshop, a patient-centered approach to multi-cancer early detection testing. I'm Jody Hoyos, President and Chief Operating Officer of the Prevent Cancer Foundation. We're really grateful and want to thank each of you for joining us from your homes and offices around the world today. And I do mean around the world. We have registrations from the United States, United Kingdom, um, Nigeria, Guyana, Ghana, New Zealand, and more. We're still receiving registrations as we speak, which is wonderful. We'd also like to thank each of our sponsors today, uh, especially our gold sponsor, Thrive, and our silver sponsor, Genentech. Thank you for your support in making this event possible and for your support in continuing the conversation today. We're also really grateful for our speakers, our facilitators, and for the Prevent Cancer staff who worked so hard to put this event together. Um, you know, we're all used to virtual events now, but it certainly takes a village to put them together, so thank you. Our mission at the Prevent Cancer Foundation is saving lives across all populations through cancer prevention and early detection. So cancer screening is a critical part of that conversation. And we're dedicated to understanding and discussing the innovations that have a potential of creating a world where no one dies of cancer. I think we can all support that as a worthy vision. And one of the innovations that we're going to talk about today, or the innovation we'll be talking about today, is multi-cancer early detection tests, or MCED, or MSED or in some cases from the research of earlier on, universal cancer screening. So when we talk about a patient-centered framework, I think nomenclature is probably one of the things that will come up today, but I just want you guys to know that you might hear multiple terms. Today we'll be using multi-cancer early detection tests or MCED. This innovative technology could bring about significant changes in how we take care of our health and how we look for cancer. But as we analyze the data, it's very important that we consider all aspects of the test. It's the, the data behind each of the data points are people, and that's what we're here to talk about today, how the, the patient can be at the center of how we look at the tests and the impact these tests could have on our, on our lives. The outcome of the workshop will be a white paper, which we will share with all participants, policymakers, and sponsors to guide future work on multi-cancer early detection tests, keeping patients and their families at top of mind as we continue forward in this work. Now, we recognize with new innovations, we may have more questions today than we have answers, and that's okay. So, so I want people to feel comfortable bringing cancer, their questions forward, asking questions that may seem um, you know, naive, we're all in this together and we're all understanding something that's very new. So we want to bring those questions forward and give us a starting point in areas that we have to dig deeper in as we put together this white paper. I know that many of you are excited to hear from Representative Terry Sewell and we regret to inform you that she is unable to join today due to the recent death of her mom. So our thoughts are with Representative Sewell and her family during this very difficult time for them. Representative Sewell is a co-sponsor of the Medicare Multi-Cancer Early Detection Screening Coverage Act of 2021. We'll talk a little bit more about that legislation in our panel discussion today, but if you're looking for information prior or after, please visit preventcancer.org forward slash early. You can also find general information about multi-cancer early detection tests there as well. Again, that's preventcancer.org forward slash early. A little bit about logistics today. So after our opening presentation, which will be multi-cancer early detection test 101 by Dr. Anne-Marie Lennon, we'll have a few minutes for everyone to share who they are, where they're from, and what they hope to learn today in the chat box. Then we'll hear from our esteemed panelists who will be discussing aspects of acceptance, access, affordability, and accountability related to multi-cancer early detection testing. We will look forward to that discussion and addressing your questions during that panel. After the panel discussion, for those of you who 
are signed up for the breakout sessions and received an email confirmation that you are assigned to a breakout session. So again, if you registered for a breakout session and you receive confirmation, we're going to have a lunch break. And I, you know, I really encourage you to take a break. We have very few unplanned breaks in our lives nowadays. So stretch, walk around, take a break, be back at your computers at 1.15 Eastern time. You will then be automatically assigned into a breakout room. And I'll talk more about that before we, we start those. For those of you who are not in a breakout session, um, you, you'll, your time with us today will end following the uh, panel presentations and a brief logistics update. So for everything I said today, make sure you know it's okay to ask questions, that we're all working through this new technology together. And for those of you in a panel discussion, be back at your computers at 1.15 Eastern. We don't wanna have an inadvertent conversation with a family member or pet, because you will be automatically assigned to that room. So without further ado, we'll kick off our, our program with an introductory presentation, Multi-Cancer Early Detection Test 101, from Dr. Anne-Marie Lennon, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, it really is a great pleasure to be here and to talk about multi-cancer early detection tests 101. Um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to talk about uh, during the next 20 minutes. The first is, why do we need early detection tests? Secondly, I want to give you the 101 of what are the challenges in detecting cancer earlier. Then we're going to talk about where are we, what have we achieved? And then finally, what are these, the questions that are still left unanswered? So let's start with the first question. Why do we need why do we need to detect, uh, detect, why do we need a new test to detect cancers? And this is the data from the um, CDC, which looks at the top 10 causes of death in the United States. And what you'll see here is that heart disease is the number one cause of death in the United States at the moment, followed closely by cancers, which account for 23% of deaths in, in the United States. However, if you look to the future, which is where, which is the most important thing, and we ask the question, where will we be in 2030? What you can see is that this will change and that the number of deaths due to heart disease will actually are predicted to decrease and the numbers of deaths due to cancer will rise. And cancer is predicted to be the commonest cause of death in the United States within the next 10 years. So where are we in 2021? Uh, well, the, the um, American Cancer Association estimate that in 2021, there will be 1.9 million individuals who will be diagnosed with cancer this year, and just over 600,000 uh, people will die due to cancer. And there's many different reasons for this, but one of the most important outcomes things when you see a patient is what stage are they? So the, one of the most important predictors of patients' outcomes, their chance of surviving cancer is when was the cancer detected? Was it detected late, in which case their chances of surviving are small, or was it detected earlier, in which case your patients have a much better chance of, of fighting and ultimately um, surviving cancer? So how can we detect cancers earlier? And there's a number of ways that we're already doing it, which is screening for cancers. So at the moment, we have, a, we have an ability to screen for several different types of cancers. For example, we have mammography to develop to detect breast cancer, or we have colonoscopy to detect colon cancer. But there are a number of challenges with these. Uh, firstly, they're not perfect. Secondly, not everybody has access to them, and not everybody is willing to undergo these tests. And finally, they account for a very small number of cancers, 
And there are many other cancers, such as ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, kidney cancer, for which no screening test exists. So let's move to the question of, is it possible to develop a blood test which can detect cancers earlier? And this is the concept. So here you can see your, this is your cancer. And the cancers release different elements into the bloodstream. Here you can see there's, circuit, there's cancer DNA, which has been released into the bloodstream. And the cancers also release other things, uh, such as a protein markers. So there are DNA, RNA, protein, and metabolites. So many different things that are associated with cancers that you can potentially identify in the bloodstream. Now, I promised when we started this that I would tell you not only about all the good news, but also about what are the challenges uh, when you're trying to develop a test to detect cancers in the blood and to detect multiple cancers. So let's just talk about this for a moment. So there's a number of challenges. So let's talk about a couple of these. So prevalence, that is how, what, how common is the cancer in, in a population? So let us pretend that we've developed a test and the test has 50% sensitivity. That means that it correctly identifies 50% of the people who have a cancer and it has 98% specificity, which means that it correctly identifies 98% of people without a cancer. And then let us look at the cancer that we're looking at, and it has a prevalence of 68 per 100,000. If we choose to screen 100,000 individuals, we will detect 34 cancers and almost 2,000 false positive tests. So one of the key challenges when we want to develop a test to screen for multiple cancers in healthy or presumably healthy individuals is that the test has to have a very high specificity. That is, it needs to, it needs to have a, a specificity of greater than 99% to ensure that we don't detect too many people with false positives. So that's one of the challenges that we have to, we're going to look at. The second one is a technical one. Can you develop a test that uh, can have sufficient sensitivity and specificity to detect cancers earlier? And again, there are many challenges with this. And this is one of them, that if you want to, for example, detect cancer DNA in the bloodstream, the amount of DNA that's in the bloodstream is tiny. One to five mutant DNA fragments in 10,000 normal fragments. And so it can be challenging to do. Fortunately, um, groups have looked at this and now we have the technology to do this, to, de to detect tiny amounts of cancer DNA and other cancer related markers in the bloodstream. So the third challenge that people have faced is a biological one is, is there enough cancer DNA or other markers of cancers in the bloodstream. And here is a, a, an example of the challenge that people will face. So this is a study that looked at identifying different types of cancers using um, looking at cancer DNA. And what you can see here is that there are different, here are patients with different stages of cancer. Stage four is advanced metastatic cancer and stage one and two, which are the ones that you wanna pick up are early stage. And if you look at this, what you can see is that the amount of, of circulating tumor DNA or cancer DNA that was in the bloodstream is much higher in people with advanced cancers and lower in people with early stage cancers. And what that means, if you look at it from a clinical perspective, is that, uh, you, it's much easier to detect patients with advanced disease, shown here metastatic disease, but it's much more challenging to detect earlier stage disease. So you can see here in pink, you have 
localized, potentially curable disease for colorectal, uh, esophageal, gastric, pancreatic, and breast cancer. And you can see the pink, which shows potentially curable disease is lower than the metastatic disease. And so what people have learned is that um, using one marker circulating tumor DNA alone is not, will not work alone. And often groups have combined different markers or cancer markers together, which we call a multi and light blood test. Now, one of the great things about many of these markers, for example, circulating tumor DNA, is that it is found, depending on which mutation you look for, for example, if you look at it for a mutation in a KRAS, they're found in pancreatic cancer, but they're also found in many other cancers. And so what, what many groups have done is they have combined different markers together to allow us to detect enough people with cancers. And they've brought markers that can detect not just one cancer, but multiple different types of cancers and have combined them into a single blood test that can detect not one, but multiple different types of cancers. So let's have a look and see how do they work and how well do they work? And again, I'm just going to show you one example. So this was a study looking at just over a thousand individuals with eight different types of cancers and comparing them to just over 800 indiv individuals with no history of cancers. And what this study showed was that it's possible with a single blood test to detect multiple different types of cancers. So here you can see that the test detected 33% of the individuals with breast cancer, almost 60% of the patients with lung cancer, just over 70% of the patients with pancreatic cancer, and 98% of the patients with ovarian or liver cancers. Now, if you remember, one of the questions was, could we detect early cancer? And so when you're looking at uh, studies, you wanna have a look at this and see not just did they detect any cancers, but did they detect not only late stage, but also early cancers. So in this study, what you can see is that between 73 to 78% of the stage two and three cancers were detected, but the test was also able to detect 43% of the stage one or the very earliest stage of cancers. Now, if you remember, one of the challenges we said was that it's critical if you want to have a test that will be used to screen asymptomatic individuals that you need your specificity to be greater than 99%. So again, when you're looking at these studies, you want to look at that. And in this study, seven of the 812 apparently healthy individuals were positive, giving us a specificity of greater than 99%. Now, when you're looking at a study, one of the questions that you want to ask is, is this a retrospective study? That is where it's a look back study or is it a prospective study? So this study that I've just shown you is a look back study or a retrospective study. And what that means is that all of the patients uh, had known cancers. And this creates a couple of problems. So firstly, the cancers are often larger and more advanced, and therefore these studies may overestimate sensitivity. Secondly, there were 800 patients with no history of cancer in this study. However, were they actually, the controls may not be, have relevant comorbidities. So what that means is, were these all people in their 20s or were the people who were the healthy individuals, were they the same age? Do they have the same illnesses? Do they take the same medications as the people who developed, who had uh, cancers? And if they're not the same, you may overestimate specificity. A third thing that people, that has been raised with these, with these types of tests is what is the risk to do unnecessary harm? What is the risk of a blood test generating multiple invasive procedures in individuals who don't have cancer? And what is the risk of a blood test giving a false sense of security 
such that individuals no longer do standard of care screening, such as colonoscopy or mammography. And we try to answer some of these questions. And so this is a study which tried to answer the question is, can a multi-cancer blood test prospectively detect cancers in individuals whose cancer was not previously detected by other means? Can such a test be used to intervene in cancer progression, leading to therapy with the intent to cure the patient? Can a blood test be incorporated into routine clinical care and not discourage participants from engaging in standard of care screening? And finally, is it possible to have a, a blood test which can be performed safely without incurring a large number of futile, invasive follow-up tests. I want to share with you a study that has tried to answer some of these questions. It looked at 10,000 women aged between 65 to 75 who had no personal history of cancer. And this is what it found. It detected 96 cancers were found in these 10,000 women. And if you look at their age, that is approximately what we would expect to find in women of, of this age group. So of the 96 cancers, 27% were identified first with a blood test. 25% were found with standard of care screening, for example, mammography or colonoscopy. And 48% presented with symptoms for example, if somebody had uterine cancer, they may have come in with bleeding, vaginal bleeding. So let's look at this in a little bit more depth. So if you look at breast cancer, in green are the proportion of cancers that were first detected with standard of care screening. In blue are the proportion of cancers that were first detected with a blood test. And in gray are the cancers that were first detected by other means. So what you can see here in breast cancer was that there were 27 breast, uh, women who had breast who developed breast cancer. The vast majority of those, 20 of the 27, were detected with mammography. Six presented with symptoms and just one was detected with a blood test. So you can see that mammography is very good at detecting breast cancer. So let's look at ovarian cancer. So here there were seven ovarian cancers. And what you can see is that six of the seven ovarian cancers were first detected with a blood test and one patient presented with symptoms. Now let's look at lung cancer for which there is a current screening test. There were 21 lung cancers detected. Three of these were detected with the current standard of care screening that is low dose CT Nine were first detected with the blood test and nine patients presented with symptoms. When you look at this study, what it shows is that 25% of all of the cancers were, de were first detected with what we currently have, our current standard of care screen. If the blood test had been available, we could have increased the numbers of cancers that were detected from 25 to 52%. Other important things is this study shows you how it's possible with a single blood test to detect, to screen for not one, but multiple different cancers. So on this, on this image, you can see the different cancers that were detected. And you can see that we detected lymphomas, thyroid cancers, breast cancers, lung cancers, liver cancers, bile duct cancers, cancers of the, of the colon, the uterus, the bladder, the ovary, the pancreas, the kidney, the stomach. Very importantly, 65% of the cancers were localized or regional, therefore potentially curable. And again, when you're looking at a test, at a study, you're going to want to have a look and see what were these numbers? What was the sensitivity? So what, how many cancers that were detected? 
What was the specificity? And again, very importantly, we need that number to be 99% or higher. And then how many patients needed to be screened to detect a single cancer? And in this particular study, it was 381. So let's go back to some of the other important questions that people are asking about blood tests to screen for multiple different cancers. And one of the key questions is, is it safe or could this blood test lead to multiple, lead to multiple other tests? And in this, in this study, in 10,000 women, there were 101 out of 10,000 women who did not have a cancer, but went on to have imaging with a PET-CT. Of those 101 women, 62 had no further investigation. 16% went on to have a non-invasive test. For example, if we found a, lung can a nodule in somebody's lung, then we entered them into the screening and, and follow up for lung nodules. 19% had a minimally invasive procedure. For example, one participant was found to have a stone blocking their bile duct and they were sent to have that stone removed before it caused problems. Overall in this study, three individuals out of 10,000 underwent surgery and two of the three of those had high grade dysplasia, which is the stage just before cancer, which I personally as a physician would say that was the right thing to do. So what this study shows is that a blood test can be performed in a safe manner. The other very important question is, if you have a blood test, will this stop people going for what we know are screening tests that are effective? And what was very nice to see was that there was no decrease in the standard of care screening in these 10,000 women who, who had a blood test. So what does this study show us? It, it has given us some answers and it shows that blood testing makes it possible to detect cancers, including early cancers in individuals with no history of cancer. It is possible to intervene on the base of blood test, leading to surgery with the intent of curing that individual of cancer. Blood testing can be incorporated into routine medical care without discouraging individuals from engaging in other forms of screening. And finally, such testing can be performed in a safe manner without encouraging, incurring a large number of futile invasive follow-up tests. So I hope I've shown you that there have been many challenges which have been overcome. We are at an incredibly exciting part of uh, this story where we now have many different groups which are looking at different types of tests. Some are looking at DNA, others are looking at micro at RNA, protein, metabolomics or methylation to detect multiple different types of cancers with a single blood test. There are still questions that need to be answered. So if you recall, we had, if you have a patient with a mutation in a KRAS uh, gene, that could be a pancreatic cancer, but it could also be a cancer that's located in other places. And so one of the questions that people are trying to answer is how do we, when you have a positive test, how do you work out where is that cancer located? And there are now several publications using different types of tests, which look extremely promising in answer, answering that question. How do you find out where the cancer is located? located? The second question is, how often should you repeat the test? For example, in colonoscopy, we know if you have a normal colonoscopy, we'll say to, to somebody, come back and have this repeated in 10 years. And so we now need longitudinal studies to know, should a blood test be repeated every year, every two years, every three years, every five years? We're going to need to show that these blood tests have clinical utility and clinical validity. And if you want to bring a test, a screening test, and use it in a population, it's critical to show that it's cost effective. And finally, these tests need FDA approval. 
and I know that many of them are extremely close to this. So thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It really is a, it's a great pleasure and I look forward to spending the rest of the day with you. Thank you.
Well, that was a great presentation from Dr. Lennon um, and a great way to set the stage for our panel discussions coming up next. And I'm getting caught up in reading all of your comments in the chat box now. So thank you for sharing information about who you are, your stories and what you hope to learn today. This is an exciting topic. These are exciting tests. And um, so, you know, as I said earlier in the introduction, we may not have all the answers today, but these are questions and information that we'll be documenting so we can provide further information. But I do think today you'll be able to get some of your questions answered, certainly, but it's nice to see what's on top of mind for all of you, again, around the world. So very wonderful discussions. I'm very excited to introduce our panel this morning. Um, I'd like to introduce and, our, and a facilitator here today, where we have Felicia Woods, Executive Director of the Cancer Policy Institute at Cancer Support Community, who will be covering access. Anna Schwamlane Howard, Principal Policy Development, Access to Care for the American Cancer Society, Cancer Action, Cancer Action Network, covering affordability. Robin Richardson, Assistant Director of Care Delivery Transformation and Community Engagement, and Rebecca Shear, Associate Director of Patient Experience, both from the University of Texas at Austin, Livestrong Cancer Institute at the Dell Medical School, covering acceptance. So Robin will be presenting today and Rebecca will be joining us for the Q&A portion. And last but not least, we have Dr. Minetta Liu, consultant in the Division of Medical Oncology, Department of Oncology at Mayo Clinic. She'll be covering accountability. Dr. Liu would not be able to join us this afternoon in the breakout session. So her group will be facilitated by Mike Capaldi, Senior Advisor at Penn Quarter Partners, marketing and, uh, marketing and public affairs firm. Thank you, Mike, and all of our panelists for being with us today. And thank you, Dr. Liu, for joining us overseas. As a reminder, we'll take questions from the audience following the presentation, so please note your questions in the chat box. Felicia, you have the floor. Thank you, Jody. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Felicia Woods, Executive Director of the Cancer Policy Institute at the Cancer Support Community. Uh, today, we are here to learn more about emerging innovation in cancer prevention and detection with a focus on multi-cancer early detection screening tests. So when I first learned about MCEDs, I was both excited and anxious. Uh, several questions went through my head thinking about these promising tests, but two questions that remained present and constant were, so what is in it for the patients and who will benefit? Both questions can be summed up into one word, access. And for CSC, whether it's cancer patients, stakeholders, or patient advocacy groups, we believe all of us want to make sure and be confident that everyone has access to much needed healthcare services, especially prevention and early detection services when it comes to cancer. And so all should have access to no or low cost preventative care, including at minimum coverage that provides for well services, cancer screening and tech testing. And these preventative services can help individuals not only prevent chronic illnesses like cancer, but can help detect and treat disease as soon as possible. As we've seen the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has re-emphasized the importance of cancer prevention and early detection as screening rates unfortunately plummeted for much of 2020. Single tumor screening and forthcoming innovative resources and services in screening and early detection like MCEDs um, must be available to all people, particularly those at risk for specific cancers and those from historically disenfranchised populations. So enhanced efforts to ensure access to screening and early detection is not only important to our nation's approach to cancer control overall, but also when we think about it, it's one key way to tackle the many disparities in cancer outcomes because we can find and treat cancer at earlier stages when patients are more likely to survive across all types of 
cancer, outcomes improve when cancer is detected early. Nonetheless, early detection tests are only available for some cancers, and that includes breast, cervical, colorectal, lung, and prostate. So that leaves many cancers without the appropriate screening tests necessary to detect cancer early. And late stage diagnosis of unscreened cancers is particularly common in people of color and outcomes unfortunately are far worse. Despite the monumental improvements in technology, the availability of evidence-based cancer screening and screening rates increasing among patients of color, disparities in access as well as utilization continue to pers persist when it comes to equitable access to new screening technologies and expanding the benefits of early detection to more people. By expanding the benefits of early detection to more cancers and people, outcomes for cancer patients could also improve. And that's one of the reasons why the promising MCEDs is very much so important. So let's take a look at some of the cancer care disparities that um, persist today. And they persist in every area of cancer care, and that's from cancer screening on into survivorship. You know, for example, Black men experience higher rates of new cases uh, and, and death uh, than white men in certain cancers such as prostate and kidney. Also, Black Americans have uh, higher cancer mortality rates than any other racial group when considering all cancer types and cancer remains the leading cause of death for Asians and Hispanics. And these cancer disparities occur because of a host of factors, including systemic racism, lack of trust of the healthcare system, lower levels of prevention, screening, and early detection in these communities, challenges across the board when it comes to high quality access to high quality cancer care, and some of the cancer common barriers to cancer screening include lack of provider recommendation, an absence of symptoms, um, fear of detection and diagnosis, and cost is a major factor that contributes to a number of barriers that we see in cancer screening. And even further, access to screening really dwindles when you think about screening for populations that have been traditionally marginalized, under-resourced, or underserved. Now, these disparities can only be meaningfully addressed when all individuals have access to and can afford healthcare services, including early detection and screening. And for CSC and many of us on this um, webinar right now, we know that everyone should have an equal opportunity to achieve the best health outcomes, no matter their race, ethnicity, gender, age, sexual orientation or socioeconomic status, or even where they live. So this is why multi-cancer early detection screening tests must be accessible and framed as accessible to all people from the onset. For MCEDs to be successful, stakeholders need to address these common barriers and disparities head on. And access to MCEDs for more diverse populations have to be emphasized and really prioritize. And you can emphasize access in a number of ways. I'll walk you through some of them. Um, one is intentional outreach and education to those traditionally marginalized and underserved and under-resourced communities, like those who are socially, economically disadvantaged, rural communities, and the, also the LGBTQIA communities. These stakeholders um, have, have have a stake in the communities where they are working, already working in the trenches to make sure that their particular communities do have access to care. But when we have advocacy groups that can come in and work together with these communities to create better outreach in a culturally appropriate way, in a very a culturally competent way, only then can we think about how that can influence access to these type of um, screening tests. Also increased availability of screening at healthcare clinics that work and serve and live in uninsured and uninsured and underinsured populations. 
So partnering with federally qualified healthcare clinics or rural health clinics, as well as community providers would be vital as these entities are already providing outpatient services and access to screening and early detection. These services specifically target health disparities and work to empower underserved and under-resourced areas. Purposeful hiring of healthcare providers of diverse ethnicities and backgrounds can also help increase access because when your provider ref providers reflect the patient population that they're treating, it studies show that people are more inclined to understand, more inclined to work with the patient population to help educate them on the best things that are important for them when it comes to their health care. Also encouraging and promoting culturally competent communication between patients and providers. So when I think about addressing health disparities, we have to think about how are we being culturally competent too, because the two go hand in hand. We need to actively train our clinicians and clinical teams on implicit bias, as well as looking at systemic racism and addressing it and figuring out how, can, how we can break down the injustices that exist in our delivery of care. A case in point is looking at the, how disparities exist among people of color, even when various clinical and socio-demographic factors are considered, such as cancer type, site of care, insurance status, and education level. Even when all of these are considered, there are still disparities when it comes to um, care for many uh, populations of color. And one last thing that is really near and dear to me is collaborating amongst cancer advocacy groups and stakeholders to ensure coverage of access to early detection and screening technologies in both private and public insurance plans covering underserved communities. Policy must be on par with innovation. You know, far too often policymakers are playing catch up to innovation. That must change in order for there to be an increase in access. And we all know from the stakeholders who are represented on this call that by raising our collective voices, we can foster change in the policy world. So those are a few of the ways to increase access to MCEDs and early detection and screening for all people. And so, you know, the more that I've learned about the promises of MCEDs, the more hopeful I am that we will be able to detect cancer earlier. At a 2020 conference that I attended on, at that time it was called Universal Cancer Screening, but also now MCEDs. During this, the discussion on access, Mr. Andy Slavitt, who's the former acting administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services said this, and I'll paraphrase. We know that the Peloton crowd of people will be first in line for MCEDs. But we need to ensure that those individuals who ride the bus every day, balancing working gig jobs and uh, working nine to fives while also being caregivers also have access to MCEDs in the same way. So I'll close by saying this, as organizations who understand the complexities of cancer care and trusted stakeholders in this community, we must work in a united manner to engage diverse groups to ensure equity and access to MCEDs, regardless of race, ethnicity, age, gender identity, geographic location, socioeconomic status, and cultural beliefs. It is our obligation to strategically work together with advocacy and patient groups, industry partners, and cancer patients and survivors as well as our community stakeholders like faith-based leaders, civil rights groups, and social justice organizations to ensure that all people have access to these new innovative tests. And before I conclude, I would be remiss in giving everyone a hearty congratulations that the long awaited ruling by the Supreme Court on Texas v. California case was decided earlier this morning about the ACA and with a seven to two decision, the ACA remains the law of the land. Again, that is something that will contribute to access. So I hope that as we all continue these conversations today, 
when it comes to MCEDs that we think about the patient populations that are traditionally underserved and um, under-resourced and look to them as a way that we can guide and work together to increase access to innovative ways to treat and detect cancer earlier. So thank you for the opportunity. And I'll now turn it over to Anna Howard with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Uh, good morning. My name is Anna Schwamlein Howard. I am a policy principal at the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. We're the advocacy affiliate of the American Cancer Society. So I do have some slides. So as they are um, being uh, pulled up, uh, next slide. So we know from research by the American Cancer Society that prevention matters, that we need to detect cancer earlier when there's a greater likelihood of, of a successful outcome, when there are more opportunities for more different treatment options available. And Felicia talked about this, so I won't rehash, every, rehash that. We know that this is particularly true for the Medicare population um, because the incidence of cancer increases with age. And most people who qualify for Medicare do so when they turn 65. We also know that having insurance matters, that people who have access to insurance, which includes access to preventive screenings are more likely to get screened um, and have a greater likelihood of a successful outcome if they have uh, cancer. So with that in mind, I just wanted to talk about these multi-cancer early detection or MCED tests under the auspice of coverage. So next slide, please. So first, let's talk about what does Medicare cover? Um, Medicare provides coverage of certain cancer screening tests and has done so long before the Affordable Care Act. Um, Congress has mandated coverage of certain cancer screening tests, breast, cervical, prostate, and colorectal. Um, Medicare also, Congress also gave Medicare the ability to cover other preventive services if the services are reasonable and necessary, if they're recommended by the United States Preventive Services Task Force, and if they're appropriate for um, Medicare beneficiaries. So Medicare doesn't uh, currently cover uh, these MCED tests that we've been talking about yet. Uh, so hence the reason why legislation is needed. So next slide, please. So in the 116th Congress, which was the last Congress, legislation was introduced that would, the, that would um, provide Medicare the ability to cover these MCED tests that we're talking about. Legislation entitled the Medicare Multi-Cancer Early Detection Screening Coverage Act, which is quite a mouthful. That legislation was reintroduced in the current Congress, the 117th Congress, which began in January. Um, there are two bills, uh, one in the House and one in the Senate. This slide just gives you some basic information about the legislation. You'll see that um, House bill was introduced back in March and the Senate bill was just recently introduced. We've got great uh, bipartisan co-sponsors on the legislation. The House has more co-sponsors than the Senate does, in part because it was introduced earlier, uh, but these numbers keep growing. Uh, we know from the conversations that we've had on the Hill and working with other partner organizations that the good thing is, is that this is not an ideological issue in terms of uh, there isn't any ideological discord over kind of should Medicare cover these tests. The issue is more of educating members of Congress about what these new tests are, what the promise holds, and why Medicare beneficiaries need coverage of these tests. Um, again, really diverse uh, sponsors and co-sponsors on the legislation. Um, and we hope to see this legislation um, enacted uh, as, as soon as possible. So next slide, please. So what does the legislation do? Uh, so the uh, legislation provides a pathway for Medicare coverage of these multi-cancer early detection screening tests. Oh. 
it doesn't say that Medicare has to cover these tests. It doesn't say that Medicare can only cover a certain number of tests. It basically says to the Medicare program, you have the authority through the national coverage determination process, which is a process that Medicare already uses to decide what it's gonna cover, to cover these multi-cancer uh, early detection screening tests. And the legislation also makes clear that this in no way, shape or form changes the coverage that Medicare already has for other cancer screening tests. So next slide. So what is covered? Um, first, the uh, test has to be approved or cleared by the FDA. And that makes sense. The FDA is a gold standard. We want the uh, FDA to be able to study these tests. Second, um, these tests uh, have to be proved or cleared by the FDA to detect quote, many cancer types. How many cancer types? Is it 10? Is it 50? Is it 100? Congress leaves that up to the to CMS, to the Medicare program to determine what is meant by many. Um, and the legislation also specifically says that the tests uh, that are used have to use either a blood or a blood product, things like plasma, um, or the secretary of HHS can also establish uh, coverage for other equivalent tests other you know, biological uh, material um, if it gets to that point, if these tests are uh, proven, again, approved or cleared by the FDA. And it also says, it says that these tests uh, should be covered uh, once a year. So next slide. So one thing that was very important for us was to make sure that the Medicare coverage of these MCD, MCED tests were uh, intended to be in addition to Medicare's current coverage. We wanted to make sure that this was an option for beneficiaries and their providers to take advantage of if the Medicare beneficiary and provider felt that that was medically appropriate for the individual. But we didn't want to in any way, shape or form change any of Medicare's current coverage. It could be that a beneficiary um, has a mammogram and also decides to have one of these MCE tests. And that's great. And under the legislation that was um, permissible. So that was very important um, for us because again, this is meant to be kind of an add-on and in no way, shape or form change uh, Medicare's coverage of other screening tests. So next slide. Um, so that is the legislation. Again, the legislation would um, say to Medicare, look, you can cover these MCE tests. And that, that is great, very important for the 61 million Americans who are covered under the Medicare program. It's also really important because there is this saying in kind of the health policy world that as Medicare goes, so does other coverage. Um, commercial coverage looks to see what Medicare coverage rules are. That does not mean that commercial coverage perfectly aligns with Medicare, because that would be far too easy. It's just that commercial coverage looks to see what Medicare does because Medicare has kind of processes in place where they look at scientific evidence and they look at um, uh, tests and whether or not it's appropriate for beneficiaries. So in looking at kind of that process, um, you know, commercial payers will say, well, look, let's see what Medicare is doing and we can, you know, take it from there kind of thing. Um, commercial plans, you know, are not bound by the legislation that I was talking about that is only pertains to Medicare coverage, commercial plans, and this is employer sponsored plans, this is um, marketplace plans. And again, just to reiterate, uh, Elise, Felicia's good news that the Affordable Care Act survived yet a third Supreme Court challenge today. Um, these commercial plans have great latitude in terms of what they decide that they are going to cover. Um, and one thing, and again, just to build on Felicia's remarks, you know, one thing that commercial plans take into account when they decide their coverage is what are things that are available, what is the evidence, what's the research that's showing, 
Um, and also, you know, what are they hearing from providers? What are they hearing from patients in terms of, you know, is there a hue and cry from the public on we want access to certain uh, tests and coverage? All of that goes into commercial plans ability uh, to decide what they want to um, cover. Another thing on the horizon when these tests become more and more available is, of course, Medicaid coverage. Now, Medicaid is a uh, joint federal and state health insurance program for low-income individuals. Those that qualify for Medicaid under the traditional benefit um, don't necessarily have access to all preventive services. That is not a mandatory benefit, but individuals who qualify for Medicaid coverage due to their state choosing to expand their Medicaid program in line with the Affordable Care Act would have access to uh, preventive screenings. So again, state Medicaid programs can decide on kind of a case by case basis, whether or not they want to cover these tests and what the parameters of those coverage, uh, that coverage would be. And finally, uh, the United States Preventive Services Task Force this is an evidence-based body. Um, it's been around for a long time, uh, but certainly has become more prominent with the enactment of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, under the ACA, um, ACA compliant plans have to cover uh, products and services that are recommended by the United States Preventive Services Task Force. Um, that receive an A or a B rating, they have to cover these products and services and do so with no cost sharing to the individual. So um, I think looking ahead, certainly coverage of these, sorry, let me correct myself because USPSTF technically does not do coverage. They only look at the evidence of whether or not preventive services should be recommended. But looking ahead, uh, the USPSTF uh, we'll likely look at these tests and determine whether or not um, these tests would be recommended. As anybody who's ever dealt with the USPSTF knows, uh, they take their uh, charge to be an evidence-based body very seriously. It is a very long and arduous process. They go through um, you know, various steps and stages in terms of research plans and um, draft recommendations and final recommendations, it, it takes years uh, for them to issue a recommendation, which is good insofar as there's time uh, that goes into this and they certainly look at anything that they recommend with great rigor, but it takes time to go ahead and do that. So that's kind of a coverage of MCED tests in a nutshell. And with that, I will turn it over to Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Robin Richardson. I am the Assistant Director of Care Delivery Transformation and Community Engagement at the Livestrong Cancer Institutes at Dell Medical School. We're the Department of Oncology at the University of Texas at Austin. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about acceptance as one of our A's. Um, so acceptance means like openness and how willing um, patients are um, are you know, willing to take on this new test? Are they open to it? Will they accept it? And this will overlap a little bit with um, access, um, but we'll see how we go. Um, hopefully I won't be repeating too much of what Felicia said. Um, with acceptance, I think it's important to note that perception is key. Um, so not necessarily science or facts, but the perception of risks and benefits. And as I talk about um, acceptance, I'll be referring to patients. And when I say patients, I really mean um, those who have been impacted by cancer or those who will be impacted by cancer, either directly or with a loved one. So when I say patients, I mean all of us. Um, so you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is the Community Cancer Advisory Board um, that is, I refer to them as my bosses. Um, so we have two advisory boards at the Livestrong Cancer Institutes and they co-direct and co-design all of our work with us. And so um, these lovely folks, we convene every month, usually in person, we have a lovely dinner together. Um, but for the last year, we've been meeting over Zoom. 
So in August of 2020, we actually um, met during our normal meeting time and we talked about the idea of multi-cancer early detection with them. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about their feedback, which I think is insightful, but I'll remind you that this is not like evidence-based research. This is just a conversation that is gonna help to um, provide a framework for our conversation today. Next slide, please. So I want to just step back just for a moment and talk about the spectrum of community engagement. Many of y'all are familiar with this or another version of this visual, um, but this is something that I care a lot about and many of us do, right? So years ago, we used to talk about outreach and, oh yeah, we should talk to some patients about this. But as we work in advocacy, as we work in um, clinical operations and innovation, outreach is not enough, right? We know we need to strive for patient involvement, patient collaboration, patient leadership, shared leadership. Only by getting over to that right side of the spectrum can we really have bi-directional communication and relationship building. So for acceptance, we really need to have relationships and not transactions, right? So um, by having built relationships, we will establish trust and trust is critical for acceptance. Next slide, please. So just to talk a little bit about patient-directed advocacy in the framework of acceptance, um, we know, again, this is a reminder, but I think it's helpful for us to continue to, to talk about these things, that patient involvement is critical, but not just patient involvement, diverse patient involvement. So we want to make sure we're thinking about diversity in all ways. So making sure we're thinking about races and ethnicities, ages, gender and gender expression, geographic diversity, diversity and socioeconomic background, and lived experience. Only by having diverse engagement can we fully understand what the potential opportunities are with this new innovation. We can understand the potential challenges and complexities of this new innovation. And can we really understand the compatibility with people's real lived experience with their values, with their needs. We could develop something really cool, but if it doesn't address patient needs, their real needs, not our perceived um, you know, version of their needs, then we will not be successful in this new innovation. And you know, this is not new. We have a lot of amazing leaders, um, organizations like Plain Tree, the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care, PCORI, and a number of others. And so we're sort of seeing all the ways in which we can have diverse patient leadership throughout um, development, throughout every stage from the idea to research and development, to implementation, to evaluation. We can involve patients and collaborate with them and have them be leaders with us through every stage. So I'm gonna charge all of us with continually asking as we work through this initiative, who are we not hearing from? Who's not at the table? And let's pull up more chairs at the table to make sure we're, in count, we're in, um, including everyone in all perspectives because we can only really improve our outcomes with this initiative when we hear from everyone. And I think it's also important, we talk a lot about um, the danger of a single cancer story with our advisory boards. You know, there's a lot of common themes throughout a cancer journey, most of which um, are around trauma and distress and often financial toxicity. These are important themes to consider, even with something as seemingly simple as a multi-cancer early detection test. Um, even that early, just the idea of a risk of cancer is going to bring up a number of things, financial considerations, emotional um, considerations, trauma. Um, so we need to be really thoughtful in how this is rolled out. And we need to make sure, again, that you know there is no one cancer experience. Everyone has a different, totally different experience based on their lived experience, based on their values, based on their family, based on their backgrounds. So all of those things need to be considered as we move forward. Next slide, please. So going back to my lovely advisory board, these are some things uh, that they gave us to think about. I would say generally they were open and enthusiastic about the idea of a multi-cancer early detection test. Um, anything in which the diagnostic process can be simplified is very much welcome from patients. Um, many patients have to go through very invasive screenings in order to get a cancer diagno diagnosis. And we know that the 
MCED is not going to eliminate that, but anything that can kind of start that path to maybe um, eliminating or reducing the need for invasive screenings is very welcomed by patients and anything that can reduce the number of screenings as well. Really the thing that I took away from that conversation is this idea that this could be a game changer for those who have historically faced cancer disparities. Those from communities of color, those without insurance coverage, those with complex medical needs, and those who are young adults. We hear often from young adults who have had misdiagnoses, um, I can talk about a number of stories that we've heard from our young adults who were um, treated for years for STDs and other conditions and ended up being cancer. And so anything that we can do to eliminate or reduce the number of misdiagnoses and reduce that wait time um, it will definitely be accepted by patients. Next slide, please. And then I would also say our advisory board, while they were enthusiastic and open about this new innovation, um, they had lots of questions, as I'm sure many of us do, and had some um, very thoughtful considerations that I'll share with you. So when we met in August of 2020, we dreamed of what a rollout of a COVID-19 vaccine may look like. We were before that stage in the US, and so we were thinking about um, sort of a parallel between the rollout of an MCED and the COVID-19 vaccine. So thinking about how thoughtful that needs to be, how it needs to be equitable, how it needs to be transparent, who's going to decide what communities, what individuals get to access those things first. That is really critical for patient acceptance. If there's an inequitable or perceived inequitable distribution, um, that could really have an effect on patient acceptance. Patients also had a lot of questions around um, some ethical dilemmas that are not unlike those that we see in cancer today. So things like, well, what if someone gets a positive result and they can't access or afford further screening or further treatment? That is not unlike what we all face in cancer today, and that's something that we need to continue to work on. There were questions and concerns around privacy, data privacy, who's going to own my data, could a positive result impact my accessing life insurance, health insurance, employment? A lot of concerns that popped up that need to be thought about as we move forward with multi-cancer um, early detection innovations. Another concern that came up was this idea of strain on the healthcare system. So many patients already have trouble accessing specialists in their communities. And if we you know, rolled this out without a lot of thought and without resources, we had a bunch of people running around saying, I have cancer, I have cancer, I need an oncologist, you know, without going through the proper screenings and, and making sure we don't wanna strain an already um, somewhat taxed healthcare system, depending on which community you're coming from. And so I will go back to the idea of trust. Trust is very important and something that the patients brought up quite a lot in our conversation. Um, trust is required, as we talked about, for acceptance. And you know, thinking about the history of medicine and research in this country and the historical atrocities that have occurred in communities of color, there needs to be a lot of work done to roll something out like this in a thoughtful way to build trust. We can't take community or patient trust for granted. We are not automatically given that trust. We have to earn it. We also know that we have to earn trust at all levels of the different stakeholders. So trust from the manufacturer, from the FDA or whatever regulatory bodies will be involved, from the healthcare system and the providers who will be rolling this out. There has to be trust all along that spectrum from patients. And then finally, there has to be really thoughtful communication, education, and support. So just as I said, just the idea of a potential cancer screen or potential cancer diagnosis um, can be very distressful, can trigger trauma. Um, there needs to be very clear next steps, both for a positive and a negative result. What does that mean? What are the risks? This is a complex medical um, test. And so we need to make sure patients understand truly what it means. And so if you get a negative test, it doesn't mean, you know, clean bill of health. What does that really mean? Making sure there's warm handoff. So if additional screenings are needed for a diagnosis, it's very clear to the patient what that is and that the burden is reduced for them, that the providers 
can take that burden on for them. And that really psychosocial considerations are given throughout, making sure that people feel um, supported and have the resources that they need. Next slide, please. So finally, I'll just leave you with a few takeaways that um, engagement is more than just a conversation. It's an ongoing relationship um, with community, with patients. We know that we're probably not going to get to 100% acceptance. It's just not a reality um, for any innovation. So that shouldn't be our goal, but we can improve acceptance when we listen and we hear what patients' values are and what their life experience is. And just to reiterate what was always already shared today, that this is just the beginning. This is not um, based in research. We have a lot of work to do, and this is we're just excited to, to kick off these conversations with y'all. So I look forward to the breakouts later today. And I will turn it over to Dr. Liu. Thank you so much, Robin. Uh, so hi, I'm Minetta Liu. Uh, I am a medical oncologist. I realize that nobody ever wants to come see me. Uh, I have been involved in liquid biopsy work for about 20 years now. Uh, and in the past 10 years, we've had the advent of being able to find tumor-related DNA in the blood. And in the past five years, have segued from advanced disease all the way now to early detection. So daunting. I'm here to talk about accountability. Uh, Robin and I did not go into cahoots about our presentations, but she lined things up perfectly uh, in her discussion about trust and the responsibilities of different stakeholders. And that includes the assay developers, the regulatory bodies, providers, uh, and the healthcare system. Uh, so the there are multiple multi-cancer early detection assays out there. There's one that is now commercially available. Uh, remember, it is not yet endorsed by the FDA or any guidelines committees, but it's out there because we know we want this, uh, but the responsibility incumbent upon us is to truly understand how to use this. The uh, assay developers have done work to look at validation. In other words, the blood test correlates when some patients have cancer. We don't identify every cancer, uh, but we can identify many, including those that don't have screening paradigms, uh, like breath, the, so outside of breath, rectal, cervical, lung, and prostate cancer. So we can find ovarian cancers and we can find pancreatic and do this. Uh, and the assay developers have shown some correlation. We want them certainly to do better because again, we don't find every malignancy. Uh, so there are multiple companies that are all working, uh, trying to tweak these different assays. Uh, and they are accountable uh, from that perspective, right? They understand that we need good sensitivity, uh, that we need good specificity, right? That we need to not be wrong. Uh, we also have to understand that when we see a positive signal, uh, that sometimes that patient doesn't have cancer with the workup, uh, but they might have cancer later. So how are we going to follow those individuals uh, in the long term? All right. Okay, so you can still hear me. I'm sorry, I am traveling, so I might have a bad internet connection. So I apologize, but hopefully you can all still hear me. Uh, so um, in terms of uh, the commercial groups, again, that are developing the assays, another important issue for them in terms of being accountable uh, is the price point. Uh, we want this to be accessible to all individuals, uh, again, within the right uh, criteria for when this should be done. We're not expecting 12-year-olds to get this blood test done. So the accountable providers need to be ordering this and interpreting it in the right fashion. The other thing we have to, again, remember, though, is that this is paradigm shifting. There is no subspecialty that currently uh, is really taught to uh, order, anyone can order a test, but to interpret the test to help lead to the diagnostic workup if one is needed. If it's a negative test, right, no signal is detected. Again, it's been said multiple times before. It doesn't mean that you're scot-free, uh, that you shouldn't pursue standard screening uh, or uh, other healthcare recommendations by providers. Uh, 
So there is a lot of education that is incumbent on us uh, in the healthcare system to be sure that patients who want the test, because we all want this, providers certainly want to order it, it's a blood draw, right? So that part is easy if we can get the coverage for it, um, but we have to know what to do with it. We have to know when to repeat it or when not to repeat it. We've talked a lot about access and uh, patients, individual patients being able to uh, have the blood test done. Uh, the current screening paradigms are all timed differently. Uh, they require different types of testing. It's really difficult if you're working, taking care of family to take all of that time off and the costs can escalate. So it's very inviting to have a single blood test. I always imagine a, a blood draw van going around to neighborhoods. <laughs> Uh, being able to draw the blood and just send it in and then giving the results back to providers to then uh, educate their patients. But our responsibility does not just end with the blood test because we have to interpret that blood test. And if there is a signal detected in a multi-cancer early detection assay, we have to have that responsibility and to be accountable for working up that signal to determine whether or not that individual truly has a cancer diagnosis. So it's not just access to the test, it's access to total health care and to oncologists or hematologists, depending on the cancer, um, to be sure uh, that we're not just, you know, again, throwing out a signal and then creating a lot of anxiety because there's nothing that we can do about it. This is where the regulatory bodies uh, are going to be very important. Uh, we, the FDA is currently thinking about how they would uh, lead to endorsing these tests. We don't really have demonstrations of clinical utility yet. In other words, that acting on a multi-cancer early detection test with a positive cancer signal will lead to improved outcomes. We all believe it to be true. I believe it will be true, but we do have to demonstrate that. It could take years before we demonstrate something like that though. So how are we going to get there faster? Because again, we already have a commercially available test right now. From the provider perspective, it's order, understanding uh, who we should order the test in uh, and what we do with those results, as we talked about before, the interval of testing, um, et cetera. So there are many groups that have to be accountable yet. Uh, there, are, there are many things to be excited about. I don't mean to temper any of it, uh, but I think things have just started. There's a Pandora's box that's been opened. Uh, very excited to be a part of making sure that we shepherd these tests properly through the healthcare system uh, and that we are truly uh, impacting lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu, and thank you to all the panelists. That was fantastic. Um, so now we're going to open it up for questions. And Dr. Liu, thank you so much for joining us from whatever wonderful place you're in right now. <laughs> the video is off, but we all did get a glimpse of what looks like paradise. So uh, thank you again for, for, for doing that and being here with us. I'm um, delighted. Good. I would like to open the chat box. Please put your questions in the chat box as we go along here. I did want to start with some questions that we've received um, from the beginning of the presentation. And I'd like to welcome uh, Rebecca Shear to, to, the, to the group today. She was off camera earlier, so good to see you, Becca. Um, I'd like to start, uh, Dr. Leo, if you could. There were some questions about what's coming up next in research. So uh, what can we expect from research going forward? Are there any studies that you're aware of that are underway that people can take a look at? Sure. Um, with respect to multi-cancer early detection based research, uh, many efforts in improving on current testing. Uh, so looking at different factors in the bloodstream to be more reliable uh, in detecting uh, cancer as early as we can. Um, this, we hope, will also lead to uh, better understandings of underlying tumor biology, right? Again, the goal is to never have to see me or to never need me to give a prescription for medications. And so with earlier diagnosis, that will ultimately uh, hopefully become true. So right now, the studies that are uh, ongoing or in development are related to uh, validation of future testing, but also implementation studies. So understanding, again, how we should be using these tests, which 
returning results to providers in sort of a guided fashion, uh, detailing what should be done next and studying that so that we know how often to draw the blood samples. Uh, what do you do if there's a positive signal uh, or not? Um, some of these trials are also looking at specific intended use populations. So whether it should be the general screening population, a high risk population, someone who has symptoms and a suspicion of cancer. Uh, so all of these studies need to be done. Great. Thank you. Becca, so as we had quite a lot of um, people who are joining the conversation today who are interested in health disparities and serving underserved populations. And one of the points that was brought up in both Felicia's presentation and Robin's is about uh, culture, cultural competence and um, literacy. So can you, uh, can you talk to any examples in your work about how addressing health literacy has been effective? So any strategies or thoughts that people can think about? Yes, absolutely. And hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here today. Um, I think in, in, and I oversee some of our um, strategic uh, operations of the clinic, and in addition, the patient experience team and work very closely with Robin. And I think what we have seen is that health literacy in oncology, the field of health literacy in oncology has evolved pretty substantially over the last 10 or 15 years. There are assessments that we can use in order to take a look and at, you know, like a patient reported outcome measure to look at what is a patient's level of health literacy when they come in to see a new clinician in our clinic. We haven't deployed that tool, but it does exist and it's a validated tool. So we can measure health literacy, but I think it gets really challenging when you have a team of providers that are not trained in culturally competent education and communication with patients. So from a patient-centered perspective, and this is not something that most oncologists or advanced practice providers would learn when they go through, through school. And I would ask Dr. Liu, like, was that something that you were able to learn when you went through your med school training and your, you know, your post-med school curriculum? But most of the time uh, now, we're able to train our clinicians only with the help of specialist educators and then relying really on cancer patient navigators to do a lot of the back and forth communication with patients who do have challenges when it comes to the culturally competent communication. So to wrap, I think I would say that um, it's critical for multi-cancer early detection screening to have a team of providers that at least has a very minimum bit of training on um, health literacy, because when we have patients who come in after getting screened and they come in for further testing, it's going to be um, a possibly frightening uh, and fear-based experience for a patient who may not know what the results of that test mean. And we wanna make sure that our providers can meet them where they're at when it comes to um, further testing and discussions around testing in, in a culturally competent way. Right. Thank you. Okay, Felicia, um, earlier when we were in the, in the green room together, you talked about an example uh, for you about how organizations can partner with community-based organizations to reach underserved populations. Um, can you share some examples with the group? Sure, happy to. Um, what are the, when it comes to thinking about community organizations and how they partner with uh, other stakeholders um, in, in the healthcare realm, I was reflecting with Jody about how I grew up in a traditionally black church in Memphis, Tennessee. And one of the things that we did every summer was have a community health fair. And through the church, through that community-based health fair, we had clinicians come who offered blood pressure screening, did glucose testing, also talked to various members within the community of uh, Memphis, just all over about their overall well-being, either well, there is psychosocial care, thinking about their mental health components, but also looking at the physical health and how now that model has been replicated in a number of churches, a number of faith-based communities, or even local communities, particularly serving um, various uh, culture, cultures and ethnicity groups. So when you think about partnering with organizations, when it comes to getting the rollout of MCEDs, I often reflect about my experience growing up in a way that those 
companies, industry partners, as well as patient advocacy groups could work together with um, community leaders or faith-based organizations to put on a community health fair to really talk about that outreach and that education about the importance of early um, detection, the, the importance of prevention, and the importance of screening as we begin to roll out these MCED tests. That's the way to build that authenticity. That's the way to build that trust that Robin was talking about and being thoughtful and not going in with your own, your own plan of how it can work, but truly going in and seeing what the community is doing to build uh, relationships when it comes to healthcare and, and adding on to that and amplifying um, the message that they're already spreading. Thank you for that. I know I'm jumping all over the, the place um, here, but um, we just have a comment that it's also important to address unconscious bias training. And I think there was, and when, when <laughs> Becca Thumbs Up uh, had asked, and Dr. Is it he, Dr. Liu, is it Dr. Liu or Dr. Liu? I want to make sure I'm saying this appropriately. Liu. Liu? Perfect. Okay. So Dr. Liu, did you have any training on cultural sensitivities or and by um, unconscious bias training in your medical education? And how common is that in um, training now for providers? So uh, I'm ancient. So uh, during my training, uh, it was not uh, formal. You sort of learn this, right, just by experience. Uh, but over the past several years, uh, there is now gratefully formal education uh, in the curriculum, both for medical students, uh, for all of the healthcare providers, right? It's everybody from like the val the person you know, parking the cars and helping people getting into the parking garage um, all the way to the providers. Uh, so gratefully, I, I think we are all more conscious, <laughs> forgive the pun, uh, about the, the need for this education and for these sensitivities. Great. Thank you. Earlier in the chat, we did have a, a, a question about FDA. So, Anna, if you wouldn't mind addressing what the role is, again, for FDA in reviewing these tests. Um, and it all, this question comes up a lot. I don't expect you to have an answer. But And when the FDA might review something like this, what their timeline looks like. <laughs> in terms of when the FDA's timeline for reviewing these tests, I don't know. Um, I would, uh, I'm assuming that manufacturers are working closely with the FDA to get through their approval process. But I will say, and again, I've been monitoring the chat and just you know, really appreciate everybody's um, interest in this topic and, and kind of sharing where everybody is. It's, it's great to kind of read the chat, chat as well. And, and somebody had posted um, that, uh, you know, the, there is kind of a distinction in terms of you have kind of the FDA uh, approval and then there is this kind of other uh, approval for these tests under what's known as CLIA. Um, and so you can have these tests that are available and not undergoing the FDA approval process. I will say that for purposes of the legislation that I was talking about, um, the legislation specifically states that in order to get Medicare coverage, these tests have to undergo the FDA approval process. And that is a very rigorous process to uh, undergo FDA approval process. From that, there is another kind of, you know, CLIA and apologies, I like work in DC and of course do not remember off the top of my head what that acronym stands for. Um, but that does allow for um, uh, laboratory, you know, a laboratory developed uh, tests be available to be marketed, but those tests are only able to be um, processed through one CLIA approved lab. So if you have kind of the FDA approval process, you're able to have the test be processed at more labs. Um, I was talking to a colleague about this yesterday because um, just wanted to prep for today. And he had the great analogy of it's like making a cake. 
So the FDA approval process is, you know, the Wegmans chocolate cake. So if any of you are familiar with Wegmans chocolate cake, uh, it's a thousand percent worth the calories. It's divine. Um, you know, they Wegmans has the recipe and they make the chocolate cakes and all their Wegmans across the country, as opposed to, you know, kind of a mom and pop bakery that makes, you know, a chocolate cake in one lab uh, or in one bakery. So the FDA approval process is the Wegmans chocolate cake can be made, you know, in many labs across the country as opposed to the mom and pop uh, bakery that's only able to process and only able to make a certain number of cakes due to the fact that it's it's only operating in one bakery in this analogy kind of one lab. So that's um, a little bit more background, probably more information than you ever wanted to know, particularly right before lunch when everybody's thinking about chocolate cake. But there, to get back to your question, there is a, a very important role for the FDA, particularly to make sure that these tests are available to the number of people that are going to benefit from them. Great. Thank you very much. It's, it's a complicated issue, so thank you for so eloquently putting that together. Uh, Robin, there are many, there's many individuals on this call that have had patient, you know, cancer experiences themselves and with their families. And I just want to take a minute to acknowledge you. And I, I see your comments and I'm still framing in my head how to respond, but I just wanted to say we are all with you in your journeys to battle cancer and for yourselves or for your families. Um, and there's also many patient advocacy groups here with us today, um, or not even patient advocacy groups, advocacy groups in general with people that are involved in this, because this test can potentially reach so many people that even groups that are typically not in cancer are interested in wanting to learn more. What would you say your recommendation is for how we can all better inform or assist the public in understanding um, information about these tests. So how did you do that when you and uh, Rebecca held these focus groups explaining this concept that was really new back in August of 2020? How did you approach it? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And so um, I would say, uh, just as I said in my presentation, I think involving patients from the beginning. So the fact that we're having these conversations and patients are here is like, uh, we're starting on the right foot and we need to make sure that we continue to engage folks throughout. Um, but in terms of how to talk about it, I think, you know, Becca and I did put some thought into making sure this is a complex topic. And um, one thing that I wanted to make sure I emphasized in my slides, which I may not have, is that, you know, patients are understanding. If you, I think sometimes we get in our heads of like, this is super complicated and they don't want to worry about it. And, you know, we can make a hundred excuses for any issue, but Patients are reasonable. Our advisory boards, like I said, we have two patient and family advisory boards that co-design and co-direct our work. We take problems to them and we balance sort of doing what Becca calls our blue sky dreaming of like, what could it look like? What could cancer care really look like? And balance that with reality. We are very upfront um, with our <laughs> patient advisors. We bring them to meetings. We um, engage them, you know, in a lot of different ways, even though we have a monthly meeting, we also try to um, bring them to the work so that they can stand there with us and see like, you know, healthcare is complicated, it's complex, especially oncology care and especially um, diagnostics. And so um, I think having patients just really understand having them being partners with them and talking about things in a reasonable way. I think, you know, when we talk with our patients, we don't dummy it down. We, we try not to use acronyms. We try um, to explain things in a way that, you know, different health literacy levels can understand. But when we um, talked about multi-cancer early detection, we were really open with them of like, we don't know what this means yet. We don't know, we don't have all of the answers, but like explore this with us. And so I think if patients understand that, you know, there isn't like this end goal or some, you know, perceived um, idealistic that they can understand the real obstacles that they are very creative, much more creative than we are in professional roles of finding real solutions. And so I think just having open, honest conversations and taking a moment to step back and provide context and background and explain acronyms, um, I think that goes a long way. Thank you. And Becca, 
we had a few questions in the chat from people from other countries um, and low and middle income countries. How, given your work and in looking at the international framework for patient advocacy uh, for new innovations, what are the considerations for introducing a test like this in those settings? And how does that differ? What a great question. Got to put my international cancer yeah. control yeah. back yeah. on the front <laughs> Um, so I think that there's a lot and we could, we could go on for hours yeah. answering that question. Someone could write a PhD just answering that question. Um, but I think baseline would be having an understanding of basic infrastructure to detect and treat cancers. And we know that over the last decade, there's been a lot of work to improve cancer control programming in low and middle income countries. Uh, that being said, I think you know, there's, there's still a need for more basic infrastructure, for example, delivery of chemotherapy and radiation oncology in particularly low income or low, low resource settings. So in cancer control, where most governments start in implementing, if there's no infrastructure at all, is in providing pain management and then going into a pediatric oncology space because the, the practice clinical practice guidelines are so so uh, well established. And then beginning with really basic uh, treatment of cancers that are well known and very treatable um, with minimum complexities and side effects. And so I think recognizing that lots of places won't have the infrastructure to detect and treat if we just dropped the test everywhere. However, everyone should have access to it, right? So it's a little bit of an ethical conundrum. Um, and then also recognizing uh, that I think there's a lot of uh, cultural nuances to how we talk about a, a screening and treatment based on um, the public health issues that have arisen in other countries. For example, there's a lot of stigma and misconception around cancer in many countries around the world. And a lot of that is based misnomers, but also based on some of the work that HIV had done to pave the way around removing stigma associated with HIV. And now cancer, to some extent, is suffering in the same way as HIV was in those in those early years in the 80s and the 90s. So I think infrastructure, um, having an understanding of stigma and perceptions and beliefs of each you know set of, of populations, and then really just being able to um, have the right pathways to build this robust, very basic infrastructure that would be needed to get patients to the right places for diagnostic and basic treatment if they were diagnosed. Perfect. Thank you. And that actually leads me to the next question. And, and Tammy, I do see your question. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get to that too. But, uh, Dr. Liu, the, you know, effectively combating cancer requires both the ability to detect the cancer early and having the available treatments um, so can you talk a little bit about how these two, you know, the objectives of early detection and effective therapeutics intersect? Sure. Well, again, with early detection, so we are able to diagnose malignancies at an earlier stage. The hope is that we can, in, in effect, de-escalate care. Uh, so we won't need as much therapy for individuals, and that will then improve quality of life and morbidity and decrease morbidity without detracting from survival, right? So that's the ultimate goal. People keep wondering why I do work in early detection because it looks like I'm trying to put myself out of business, and I really am. I think I've said it 15 times already, but uh, we do need novel therapeutics. Uh, a lot of our new therapeutics that are coming up are gratefully targeted. Uh, they are therefore less toxic. Chemotherapy is an important tool in our anti-cancer armamentarium, but it should not be our only tool. Uh, so we do need to continue to develop these therapies. And as we can not only diagnose malignancies earlier, but characterize them. So it's not just about where they come from, but it's the biology that underlies them. We should be smarter about how we treat them. Great. Thank you. Okay, we have a question about why, why are so many people scared of multi-cancer early detection tests? And I'd actually want to understand a little bit more of the who you mean by people and if it's um, the public in general to receive the tests. So if you wouldn't mind adding that in your chat. Uh, but I think um, from you know, Robin's presentation, one of the considerations and Felicia's 
is there's a lot of trauma and fear that goes into getting a test that might give you a diagnosis or information that you don't want to hear or aren't ready to hear. Um, public because she said dress. Yeah. So, so that is, it's just the humanity of the unknown and understanding what, what that may mean to you and to your family. So that's also a barrier in cancer screenings that we have today. So single organ cancer screenings, that fear of the, the, um, the system, fear of what you may find out is, is a current significant barrier. Fear of the financial implications is another huge one. And the second question there is why do insurance companies, including Medicare and Medicaid, get to pick and choose what cancers to cover when people do get a rare cancer? So I think if that's regarding screening, uh, what, what screenings they cover, um, Anna, uh, would you mind just addressing? Sure, uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, Medicare is a you know, federal program that's been around since 1965. And since that time, Congress has just added on to it. So it's very much like a house with a really great foundation and a lot of like funky kind of wings to the house. Um, and so Medicare's coverage of screening has evolved over time. In terms of the screening tests that Medicare covers, again, some of those are congressionally mandated. Um, they also do uh, are influenced by what the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, recommends. So there is kind of a different. It's not an automatic process. There is a. Uh, uh, there are various steps that need to be done. But uh, you know, I go back to you know um, what Dr. Lennon had talked about this morning in terms of there's kind of a difference of screening tests. You know what you're going to the tests that you're going to give to all individuals who may be asymptomatic versus a test for someone who um, you know may be suspected to have you know pancreatic cancer, for example. There isn't a pancreatic a pancreatic screening test that you would undergo. Um, for the general population, it, would, it may be something that, you know, or, or, or brain cancer, for, for example, where it may be more of a question of you have a, uh, an individual who presents in a certain way and therefore you do a test on a single organism or single organ to determine whether or not they have a cancer. Um, so Medicare is limited in the screening tests that they cover, but Medicare treats all cancers um, and uh, provides coverage for the treatment of all cancers. So there is a difference between screening and treatment. I was on mute. Sorry about that. Felicia, I'm going to give you a hard one. <laughs> what can we do or what can we think about in terms of minimizing patient anxiety? What are the things to think about? And I just want to, you know, and others to chime in as well as we go into, you know, our breakout sessions. So what can we do to minimize patient anxiety? Um, honestly, I think forums like this are first and foremost, being, being thoughtful. Uh, one of the biggest things is you never wanna roll out something without providing as much information as possible, without providing an open um, opportunity for people to give feedback, to give their initial thoughts. Um, Robin and doing that focus group in August of 2020, even presenting an idea to a group and having them say, make comments about what would that mean to them? That's one thing that I brought up in the, um, at the start of my remarks. So what is it in, so what is it in there for the patients? So you have to think about that, so what? Like when I'm thinking about my job and my nine to five or being the principal breadwinner for my family, should I take this test? What the information that I find out, would it be helpful for me or would it be detrimental to me? And so you want to be able to have people be able to ping pong and have that conversation, because if not, all of that mistrust continues or that fear continues and they won't go and get the test. So thoughtful conversations, um, also making sure that 
people are aligned in their approach when it comes to policymakers, innovate, innovators, industry, as well as patient advocacy groups. We have to work in a coordinated effort to get to reduce that anxiety because we know even from this chat that people are anxious. So if we're all the stakeholders who are saying this is important, this will help reduce um, cancer mortality rates if we increase cancer screening through the NCED test, then as a collective unit, we have to be on the same page to present that information out to, um, out to the community in order for them to say, all right, well, I'm gonna take, take the chance to get this NCED test. So again, I, I would say thoughtful, robust conversations such as this as we continue to roll it out and building those partnerships to make sure that they're authentic in, in, in our approaches. And, and I just, just to add on what Felicia said and, and agree with her 100%, I think that this is an opportunity for more kind of patient education, more understanding of what these tests are. We're not yet to the Jetsons age. You know, there, there are, you know, um, limitations on the test. What, what will these tests show? What is kind of the next step? But I think this also provides an opportunity to be less of a, this is something that happens to the patients. This is an opportunity for the patients to have a voice. And there needs to be an opportunity for education and meaningful education and meaningful discussion. This is not, the goal here is not you walk into a doctor's office and you get your blood drawn for your cholesterol at the same time that you get an MCED test and you get, as a patient, get just presented with information that you may or may not understand. This really, we need to kind of move away from things being done to patients and having, and to the point where patient is actually a meaningful part of, um, you know, their healthcare decisions. Um, so that that's why I think this this test holds great promise you know, to the extent that we can have those discussions. Excellent, excellent points. Um, it's and what we're seeing in the chat and you know from people is incredible excitement too. So the anxiety is also it's excitement. It's when can I get a test? Is there a test available? And so this conversation and making sure that the patient voice is involved and people are part of these conversations is incredibly exciting. So I really appreciate all of you being here today. Um, we are now going to break, for those of you in the breakout sessions, we are now going to break for lunch and you will come back to your computers at 1.15 Eastern time. Um, if you are not joining us for a breakout session, then that will conclude your time today and you, we will be in touch uh, with a survey where you can add your ideas and your comments and additional considerations for us after this event. So again, just be back. If you've received a confirmation email with um, your registration for a breakout session, be back at 1.15 Eastern and we'll continue to address questions and discuss ideas today. Um, so thank you to our fabulous panelists who will be facilitating those conversations and Mike Capaldi will be joining us to facilitate the conversation on accountability. Thank you all. Enjoy your break. <laughs>